This is going to be a very practical message. Uh, this is not theory. This is not something that I read in a book. This is all personal experience. And if I were to title this, it would be called, Go Ye into All the Campuses and Preach the Gospel. We've got a campus at Saint, uh, down in St. Cloud. It's called St. Cloud State University. And I don't know if you know this or not, but St. Cloud State is not a Bible college. <laughs> it's not even close. And I just have a burden to reach the people. And I'm just going to ask you to do three things. Just remember three things. Listen to uh, Pastor, Pastor Kakuza's message. It's on YouTube. It's called, When God's Passion Becomes Our Passion. And he talks about Jesus looking at the multitude and he had passion on them and co compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And the second thing I want you to do is take your eyes off yourself. I mean, uh, you know, it's real easy to get focused on me, me, me. Let's get our eyes on lost souls that are going to hell and focus on them and understand it doesn't matter what embarrassment or what cussing or what we need to go through to get somebody to heaven. And then the third thing that I want you to do is uh, write this question down. Has anybody ever showed you from the Bible what it takes to go to heaven? We're going to do all this to get to that question. That's the billion dollar question. Because some people say, yeah, they showed me. Okay, well, can you show me? <laughs> you know, and a lot of people say no, because I went to church for 32 years, and I didn't know what the Bible said about going to heaven. It's a real tragedy. <clears throat> and so uh, and, and when I went there, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just uh, you know, last month, they didn't need, need me at work. So I had like three weeks off, and I went to campus every, every day as much as I could. And so I went there, and I didn't know what to do. And I, I saw this guy who's preaching the gospel in front of the student union. And I thought, wow, how's he do that? And so I'm leaning, in the, leaning against a pole, a light pole, and he's in the sun, I'm in the shade, and I'm just waiting for him to get done to see, you know, how does he do that? And students are walking by. And so I start handing out tracks, and the heaven tracks. And they start, I just hold them up, and they're taking them. I said, hey, you want some good news? And they're taking them. And uh, what is it? Good news. Are you getting one of these? And then I saw all these students coming out of the dining set. It's like, wow, I should be over there. So I'm sitting on a ledge about this high, and... And I just, I don't force it on people. You know, the Bible says don't throw pearls, be force wine. Okay, I, if they want it, I give it to them. But a lot of people, they'll walk as far, I mean, they got the whole sidewalk to walk on, and they're you know, six inches as far as away as they can from me. It's really interesting. And I'm sitting there, and a student comes up, and he has a track already, and I got some questions about this. I mean, you don't work to go to heaven? I said, no, Jesus did the work. It's a free gift. And I said, yeah. Well, how do you get it? Do you believe? And I answered all his questions, and I invited him out to church. I said, yeah. I said, come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He goes, Wednesday night? I said, yeah. He says, uh, that's tomorrow night. I said, yeah. He goes, I'll be there. And I hear that a lot, and they never show. But he showed up, and he showed up on Sunday, too. So praise God for that. And, uh, and then at that, well, they got football games there. And so I, they, all the kids, they got to walk from their dorms across this road on this walk bridge and to get to the stadium. I thought, I'll just stand there and held up hand out tracks on Saturday. And they took them, you know, and, uh, and then at, at church, I said, hey, you guys want to hand out tracks at the football game? And I got like four or five people to come at this one time. And it was a busy day. They had a one o'clock football. They had a three o'clock girls hockey, four o'clock volleyball, and a seven o'clock hockey. And we handed out a stack of tracks probably this time. Huh. And those guys, we only had five guys there for about an hour, you know, but they just came in when they could. And, and one, one time, April, she's a student from St. Cloud State, and she's been going to our college for probably two, or our, our church for about two years. Just loves it. Just loves it. And she's so polite and sweet. And she's, you know, when she's handing out tracts, and a lot of us have never done it before. And she goes, would you like to take this from me? Would you like to take this from me? <laughs> and they'll say, uh, what is it? And she goes, and it's the quiz track. She goes, it's a quiz with an answer inside. You know, it's just so sweet. But she loves our church, and... Uh, she loves it because it's, she understood that we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. And when she understood that, she was so excited, she goes back and she tells her boyfriend, we're saved by grace, we aren't by, it's not by works, it's a free gift, and it's by believing. And he goes, yeah, I know that. She goes, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and it's pretty convicting to me how many people could say that to me. And so uh, it's just something to think about. Uh, and then also, uh, I was sitting in, behind the business building one time, and, and I just tried to keep a low profile, you know, in some place, hey, you can't do that. There's, oh, I didn't know that. So I just go where they didn't tell me that. And I'm behind the business building, and a guy comes up to me, and he says, uh, he says, uh, you should really empty out your mind. I said, I said, what? He said, empty out your mind. You should really do that. I said, why would I want to do that? He says, so you can know everything. Yeah. Empty out my mind so I can know everything? It's like, the Bible never says empty your mind. The Bible says, meditate on the Word of God day and night. It never says, empty your mind. And that brings me to uh, this right here. Uh, yoga seems to be sweeping our country. 
And uh, I just encourage you, if you're into yoga or thinking about it, I'm just encourage you to watch this one. All types of yoga, this video, it's on YouTube. All types of yoga are demonic. Okay, and this is a yoga instructor. If you can't put your head, your foot behind your head like she can, she probably knows more than you do. So listen to this video. And she talked about a voice coming out of her that it wasn't hers. She was possessed. This other one, take 15 minutes and watch this guy. Uh, yoga is a satanic spiritual practice, beware. And it's uh, I'm not against stretching, I'm not against exercise, but understand every yoga stretch is a worship to a Hindu God, to a Hindu God. Just understand that. And I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just saying, be, you know, educate yourself. And you know, watch these and make your own decision. But I am saying, whatever you do, don't empty your mind. You know, that's not biblical at all. And so uh, I'm at, and I'm at St. Cloud State again, and uh, another time I'm uh, in front of the student union, Atwood, and, and I'm just sitting there, you know, handing out, you know, wants some good news, wants some good news, and I see this guy comes, and he's got a sign like that, but it says, uh, Jesus Awareness Day. He's got a stool, and he just starts preaching. Just starts preaching loud and proud, and, you know, Muhammad can't save you, and he's dead, and he's in the grave, and all this stuff, and you don't have a God that loves you, you don't even know if you're going to heaven, he's just preaching, and then, Pretty soon there's a guy with a clipboard standing next to him, you know, and, he, and, he, and listening to him. And then he had to fill out this clipboard, and they brought out this sign that said, uh, Free Speech Zone. And he's preaching away, and the Muslims are getting mad at him, and mad, mad at him, and the homosexuals are getting mad at him. He said, You guys can't go to heaven, and uh, they're swearing at him and stuff. And I, I move a little closer so I can hear that a little bit better. And he's out in the sun, you know, and he's out there for a couple hours. So I went in, and I got him a bottle of water, you know, and he comes out and says, Thank you, brother. And then I went and I said some more, and there's one of the guys that I know is like, don't give him water, don't give him that, you know. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and one of the homosexuals comes going by, and it's just upset, you know. And, and, and I just hold out my track, and they keep walking, and they stop. And they come, they turn around about five feet away, ten feet away, and they say, thanks for being discreet. But no problem. <laughs> and he keeps going. And then uh, Yusuf comes by, and that's a, a friend that I've met over the years. Um, we uh, have mutual respect, I think. We disagree on what we believe, but we are real cordial, you know, and I like him. And he says, uh, you know, Muhammad, or Abraham was the prophet for his day, and Jesus was the prophet for his day, and Muhammad was the prophet for his day. And I said, well, since they're all the prophet for all the same God, do they all say the same thing? And he goes, yeah. And I said, did uh, Muhammad ever say, love your enemies? Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you? And it's like, you didn't have a good answer for that. Another question could have been, hey, did Jesus ever say, cut your heads off? You know, these things that are different are not the same. And there is a difference. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. You know what Allah wants you to do, wants me to do? He wants me to kill innocent people and die for Allah. There's a big difference. A big difference. And you aren't seeing this on the news. This is the best guy, David Wood. He, if you want to learn more about Islam and what the Quran says, Listen to this guy. He's got a YouTube channel called uh, X, X17 Apologetics. And listen to his Jihad Triangle. If you know what's in the Quran, if you believe what's in the Quran, and if you obey what's in the Quran, you're going to start killing people. You're going to start killing the infidels. Okay. And most people in America, they got one or two of the three. They don't have three of the three. A lot of people over in the Middle East, they got three of the three. That's why they're cutting people's heads off. And they'll, you know, and, uh, and the other one is the three stages of each jihad. When they're minority, they're all concerned about minority rights. You know, and it's a peaceful religion. And then there's a defense of a jihad. And then when they have the majority, guess what? There's no minority rights. It's you do it your way or die, their way or die. And so I'm, uh, I'm handing out all these tracts. And pretty soon we got different tracts and heaven cards and quiz cards and that. Pretty soon people are saying, I got it, got it, got it. You know, all the students, they already have, have what I'm offering. It's like, I'm going to have to start talking pretty soon. And so I went and I got this sign made, and I started preaching, you know. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's his crucifixion. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Do you have eternal life? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you believed? Do you have everlasting life? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, we're all condemned. He came to save us. Are you saved? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You know, have you believed? Are you condemned? And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Okay, and I just started preaching, you know, it's a great day to be alive, you know, but guess what, you're going to be dead someday. Someday there's a tombstone with your name on it, where are you going to be? Are you going to be in heaven? You're going to be in hell. Jesus died so you can go to heaven. Satan lies so you can go to hell. Who are you going to believe? 
Satan's a liar and he's the father of it. He's come to kill, steal, destroy. Jesus came to give you life and have it more abundantly. You know, he came to give you love, joy, peace. Do you have peace with God, knowing that all your sins are washed away? What are you going to be like on your deathbed? You know, are you going to be like George Washington? His last words were, doctors, I'm dying, but I'm not afraid to die. He knew where he was going. Or you can be like Voltaire, that atheist who mocked the Bible his whole life. He was tormented for three days before he died. I think he saw the demons that were coming for him, and he was scared to death. And if you haven't put your faith in Christ, you should be dead, scared to death. And so I just preach me like that. You know, what's the foundation for your faith? Is it a religion? Is it, a, is it uh, your parents? Is it uh, your church? Is it uh, your intellect? Is it your atheism? Athe atheists, atheists even have faith. Their faith is in a big bang where nothing explodes and makes everything. Atheists believe that hydrogen and helium miraculously turn into people. You know, and I'm here to tell you that you're not a mutated animal. You're made in the image of God. You know, and you've got a spirit that's going to live forever. And I just preach like that. And, uh, and I get, F you, Christian, you know, this ain't church, or stick to the Bible, all this stuff. And I expected the static. I expected that. But what I didn't expect is people would come up to me and they'd say, hey, I like what you're doing. I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. I said, well, it'd be great, but I don't drink coffee. And I said, well, how about tea? And I said, sure, you know, can I get you something to eat? And she goes, and I said, yeah. And so they gave me a cup of tea with a head of wooden stick. I'm not sure what that was for. And then a pastry. And other people, they come up and they, and I've had people give me a mocha. April gave me a mocha. Never had a mocha in my life before. So I had a mocha. And then last Thursday, when it's really cold out, and I'm bundled up like the Michelin man, and I go there, man, I'm showing, you know, bundled up. And uh, two guys, two people gave me cocoa. I never knew it before. And one disagreed with what I was saying, but they wanted me to be warm. And somebody else came and they offered to give me cocoa. And I thought, oh, how about orange juice? And they got me orange juice. And somebody else bought me, oh, what they give me? Drummies, chicken drummies and fries. You know, and it's just, it's just amazing. You know, Jesus is very polarizing, but he's very unifying, too, for the family of God. And what really shocked me, I was packing up one day, it was probably 5.30, it was dark, and uh, this girl comes up to me and says, can you pray with me? Never seen it before in my life. I said, sure, what's up? She said, my, my boyfriend's going through Army Ranger training. Can you pray for him? I said, sure. Is he jumping out of airplanes? And he goes, she goes, next week. And uh, so, yeah, we prayed. I was saying, it's Isaac, you know, pray for the guys in our military, keep them safe. Um, and I do more than just uh, preach, because people can turn out, tune out preaching pretty easily, I think. And you might think this is kind of goofy, but I sing hymns. Inside that book, inside, you know. This is my survival. When I go there, I got some lunch, I got some tracks or heaven cards, I got a hymnal, and I got a Bible. And I sing to them. You know, he said in Sunday school how the music is powerful. And I sing hymns, those hymns that you heard this morning, and the ones you're going to hear at the end, I sing those. Students hear those. Jesus paid it all. You know, grace greater than all our sins. Uh, amazing grace, there's a Redeemer. You know, are you washed in the blood? And just singing about Jesus Christ. And some people, that they won't take the track when I'm preaching. They'll take it when I'm singing. And, uh, and people, one time we had five guys from our church singing there. I invited him, hey, I'm going to be at college. You guys want to come by? We had five guys singing. And uh, Jenny, just, it was wonderful, you know. And so and Rick Steffes, he loves to come. He's there, you know, he came like five days in a row, and it's just me and him singing. And a girl comes up and says to him, you got a wonderful voice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, but uh, the, other, the other song that I sing is uh, In Christ Alone. That is such a powerful song. I, I, I wanted to, when I, I didn't know the words, I bought, the, the, I bought it off the internet. I got the sheet music for that. And, uh, and I just, it's just so resonating. I just love that song. And this guy here, this, uh, this David Wesley, if, you gotta, if, you gotta, if there's somebody who has everything, you can't buy him anything, he's got everything, get him this, this uh, basement praise. It's just him, it's a cappella. He's doing all the voices, and it's so beautiful, so beautiful. And the other th gift that you can get somebody who has everything is this DVD called St. John's in Exile. This is a one-man play, and secular critics call it the classic, a contemporary classic. It is so powerful. It's Dean Jones, he's acting out John and Patmos, and you'll never see the Bible the same after that. And if it's not in your Bible, it says no, so I'll leave that here for you. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> But I go there, and uh, this thing wasn't waterproof, and it was raining, and it was blustery, so I just stood underneath their walk path that goes from building to building. And I just want them to know that I care. You know, I'm not just a fair weather guy here. And, uh, and somebody comes up to me and says, what are you doing here? And I've had probably five, six people say, why are you doing this? 
And I said, because I want you to go to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why? Why? You know, are you getting paid for this or what? I said, no, I just want you to go to heaven. And I said, well, what's your story? Why? What motivates you? So then I could tell them what Jesus did in my life. A long story short, it uh, took a wrecked marriage. We were married for five years and it had serious challenges. And for two years, we're looking for the answer. Priest didn't have it. Counseling, retrovi, weekends, nothing. Christian counseling, they didn't have the answer. And we were this close to a divorce. We were separated. We took, we had an apartment, but we'd take, take, take uh, we'd uh, take turns staying there. So every week, you know, we'd be putting the kids to bed. And uh, we finally, this just ain't working. So we were going to get a divorce the next week. We were going to finally contact the attorney. And I had contact, con contacted one before. It's like, can you help us divide up this stuff? He says, I'll represent you or I'll represent her, but I won't do that. It's like, well, that's just a dynamic for a fight. And I didn't want that. And so, but praise God, the week before we were going to get a divorce, I heard the gospel. After going to church for 32 years, I never knew what the gospel was. I didn't know, unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. I didn't know that. I didn't know that Jesus, is, he did all the work, he paid for it. And I accepted Christ as my Savior. And, uh, and the Spirit of God came in. And the Bible made sense. Before that, it was just an outdated, antiquated book. It didn't make any sense. But what, that's because I was a natural man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Until you're born again, the Bible's not going to make any sense for you. You're not going to get the answers. You can understand the gospel, but not, not much else. And so we started a Bible study, my wife and I. It was Black Abyss Experiencing God. And my wife, the Word of God, she got born again too. So now instead of two sinners, selfish sinners living together, now we got two baby Christians living together. And so I know what it's like to, to live with an unsaved person and a saved person. And trust me, it's better to live with a saved person. And it's vice versa. And so basically the Word of God is sharper than powerful. And each, it's powerful. It can change lives. I don't know what challenge you're going through, but Jesus is the answer. And the first step is you need to be born again. Put, let him wash away your sins. He wants to do that. And so I'm talking and I'm sharing and stuff like that. And then I, I realized that uh, this sign, I'm going to have to get it lamp waterproofed. So I bring it to Kinko's and, uh, or whatever it's called now. I'm at the workstation getting ready to laminate. And there's somebody who's probably 70. He's running off all these copies. And it looks like it's a picture of a saint on it. I'm not sure. And uh, he says, oh, what are you going to do with that sign? Put it up at your church? And I said, no, I put it up at the college. He goes, you just do it there? And I said, no. He goes, what do you do there? I said, I try and help him understand the gospel. And then, and then I bring it up to get laminated, and I bring it back, and uh, or I come back, and he says, what do you think of the new pope? And I says, I don't know much about him. He was always a humble man. He's a humble man. He accepts all faiths. He says that uh, religion is at its worst when it's uh, proselytizing, because now we're talking instead of listening. And I said, well, didn't Jesus say that I'm the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father but by me? And he goes, you take the Bible literally? I said, yeah. He said, so do you think we should stone rebellious children? And I said, well, that was written to the Jews for that time period. He said, so you don't take it literally. Well, I said, and I said, well, I take it in context. And then he said, well, the Gospel of John, that was written so far removed from when Jesus lived. And I said, well, did Jesus say it or didn't he? And he said, well, you know, the Bible, when you translate stuff, it's, it loses meaning. And I said, well, is, is the Bible the Word of God? And uh, he says, you're not hearing me. When you translate stuff, it, it, uh, it loses meaning. And I said, well, well, what part of the Bible can I trust? You know, what can't I trust? And he says, you're just trying to argue. And I said, no, I'm trying to learn from you. You know, if I can't trust the Bible, what, what can I trust? And he said, this conversation's over. And so I just uh, whipped out my Bible. I had this little one with me at the time. And I just started to silently read the Gospel of John. And I thought, you know, I can go see if my sign's ready, but I'm not. I'm just going to stand here and do this. And he finished up, he had all his copies, and as he walks by, he says, he goes, well, at least, he goes, what did he say? He said, at least if I'm in hell, I won't see you there. And I said, you don't want to go to hell. And he stopped, and he said, you know, I, I really shouldn't have said that. You know, I said, that's all right. And, and he left, and he went out in the parking lot, and he came back in, and he said, you know, I really shouldn't have said that. Can you forgive me? And I said, yeah, that's all right. And I said, and he said, uh, no, no, will you forgive me? And I said, yeah, I forgive you. And then I gave him one of these heaven cards. And uh, this was a link that you can go in there. It's just got a website. It's a link to our, it's got our phone number, and it's a link to Master Kakuza doing the hand gesture so you can know you're going to heaven. And he said he'd look at it. And my prayer is that uh, he goes to St. Mary's Cathedral because at the time this was happening, uh, that, this was on a billboard that you could see from St. Mary's Cathedral. 
And so, uh, yeah, it's just been interesting. Um, and it reminds me of I was, uh, I was preaching in front of the library one time, and this kid goes by, a student goes by, and he yells out, he yells out, I'm going to heaven, I'm Catholic. And I said, you don't have heaven, you got purgatory. How do you know you're not going to purgatory? And he stopped. And the student just stopped dead in the tracks for about 15, 20 seconds. Students are walking by him, you know, it's a busy time, and he's just standing there. He goes, that's a good question. <laughs> and I said, I know, I asked the priest who did my mom's funeral the same thing, and he had, didn't have a good answer either. And because my mom, she died a few months ago, and I uh, did ask the pastor, you know, what assurance do we have that she's not in purgatory? And he said the way she lived her life. And he didn't even know her. Okay? It's works-based, is what he's saying. And then I said, later on I asked him, you know, you've given your life to God. You know, you've sacrificed everything to serve him. How do you know? What assurance do you have that you're not going to purgatory? And he says, I don't. So he said, if I know it, then I don't have faith, and we're saved by faith. So he tap dance around it like that. But it's true, they don't have the assurance. And then, uh, but there is, you can be sure. First John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you believe in the name of the Son of God. You can know that. And I've showed that. I got my mom a Catholic Bible, so that, and I'd read short verses like this. And I brought that Bible to her wake, and somebody didn't want that Bible. It was really an interesting situation. It's like the Word of God should give comfort. You yeah. know, that's not a Catholic Bible. Yeah, it is. I mean, you can get saved in a Catholic Bible too. Yeah. And so it's just interesting. And then I was uh, at St. Cloud State one time, and Maggie comes up to me. Oh yeah, when you when you meet people at St. Cloud State, ask them, hey, can I friend can I can I friend request you on Facebook? And a lot of people say yeah. And then I can communicate. Like today we're having a turkey dinner after the service. I can send them the I can forward stuff to them. It's just a neat way to communicate, and then you know their names and their faces. It's a little easier to remember. But maybe Maggie asked me, what do you think of homosexual, homosexual marriage? And I said, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God says. And she says, well, what does God say? And I said, well, if you go into Matthew chapter 19 or Mark chapter 10, Jesus defines marriage as between one man and one woman, and he's quoting uh, Genesis 1 and 2. And it says, Basically, it's one man and one woman for life. But, but God is joined together, let not man put asunder. And, uh, and basically, a marriage is one man and one woman coming together. They have a potential to have children. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And they can have children, and that's the best environment for a child to grow up with a husband and a wife forever. That's the best environment. You know, and then we put, as, as, as we grow up, we start to sacrifice for our kids, you know, we want to do what's best for them and put their needs ahead of our needs at times. And what I see in America, especially with Planned Parenthood and abortion, it's like we got this two-year-old mentality. I want to do what I want to do and I don't care about the consequences and oh, by the way, I want you to pay for it. You know, it's time for America, it's time to grow up, you know. You're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences of your choices. You know, if you don't want to have a baby, don't have sex, it's pretty simple. And so we start saying, and they had a Planned Parenthood rally at St. Cloud, and, uh, or a protest. They lined the streets. It was a pro-life rally, 40 days of life or something like that. And they're, they're praying the rosary in front of it. So I go down to the corner where I don't hear it. And I'm talking to one of the organizers and sharing my faith, actually. And uh, they come up and say, is anybody here from another religion? And she goes, yeah, Brian is. Well, they want you other religions to pray. I say, oh, OK. And they gave me the microphone. The, the KCs are there and everything, and they gave me the microphone. And I said, dear God, you know, we just are so sorry for the, 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 the abortions that are, that are in this country, the innocent blood that, that's shedding, and you hate that. And we just say, and I said, dear God, you know, this is just a symptom of a much deeper disease. This is, the disease is sin. We have a sin nature. You know, not only do I pray for those babies to live, I pray for the moms to get saved so they can go to heaven. And see, I, go, I don't pray to end abortion, I pray for moms to get saved. And if they're saved, they're probably going to be pro-life. And she goes, what a tragedy that would be if you can convert somebody to be from pro-choice to pro-life and they end up in hell. And so that's my perspective. And I got to pray before that. And uh, in front of everybody, and some people thank me, and, and handed out some heaven cards. For, but anyhow. Um, then there, later on, there was a Planned Parenthood uh, support rally there. And there was a counter support. And I showed up just to see what's going on. And it was the same thing. You know, they just have, it's the two-year-old mentality. I want to do what I want to do, and you better pay for it. And they had this one chant, pro-lifers don't care if women die. And I yelled out, well, then have the baby. It's, cheap, it's safer to have the baby than it is to have an abortion. You know, if you really cared about the women, have the baby. 
and uh, there was a couple of other things. And I was over across the street. I was, I, I was, I, I, I don't know if this is the right thing, the Christian thing to do, but I was yelling at him. Don't tell anyone. And uh, the media was there for their support the Planned Parenthood rally, but they weren't there for the, you know, when we were pro-life rally. The media wasn't there. And one of the, one of the, the reporters from, from the campus television, she goes, you know, we want some sound bites. Can you yell at them again? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I can yell at them. But uh, I don't know if that was a Christian thing, but it, I just wanted to expose the errors in their thinking. We don't need Planned Parenthood. And uh, so that was kind of a tangent that wasn't in the notes. Uh, it's free of charge, I guess. Um, I had somebody come up to me and say, uh, and I said, I said, ma'am, are, are you on your way to heaven? She goes, I can't go to heaven. I said, why is that? She said, because I, I like guys and I like girls. And I said, wait, well, Jesus died for you too. He died for the sins of the whole world. And then she asked me what I believed. And I told her, and I talked to her for probably 20 minutes. And uh, you know, offered her to track. You know, at least she's, she knows the gospel. She knows the gospel. She didn't take a track, but she knows the gospel. And there was one day this guy stood and talked to me for like three hours. You know, and some guys they just want support. You know, just it's just me that uh, you know. It's just an interesting place there. But as far as the one who like girls and like guys, it's like what? Why are they getting confused? And I would put it squarely at the foot of our education system. Here's a gay activist that says, of course, our goal is to indoctrinate children into the LGBTQ agenda. Um, you know, the gay theme materials and policies pushed in grade schools across North America are for the sake of indoctrinating. And it's working. I've got a co-worker who's got, he sent his kids to the public school and they see nothing wrong with homosexuality now. And what are they going to teach his grandchildren? For the sake of your grandchildren, get your kids out of the government schools. You know, every church should have a school if you care about your kids, because the school system, the government school system, is going to brainwash them into thinking that God's word doesn't mean what God's word means. And you look at our state, or this happened just last year, the Minnesota State Athletic Association, they said, hey, if you think, hey, if you're a guy and you think you're a girl, you can play on the girls' team. And not only that, you can use the girls' shower. And you can use the girls' hotels. And there's a lawsuit right now, a school in Illinois, you know, there's a guy who thinks he's a girl and he wants to use the girls' locker room. And they said, no, you can use this private room over here. And we'll keep our girls safe. You go over there. And uh, he's suing them. He says, no, I want to go to in the girls. And guess what? Obama says, you better let them use the girls' bathroom or we're going to cut the funding. And that's the problem with our country. we got federal governments, federal agencies telling us what to do. Because it used to be that the highest authority in a school was the school board. And that was typically made of parents who cared about their kids. And then went to the school district, and then went to the state. Now we got the Department of Education at the federal level. The farther away decisions are made from the people, the worse it is. And that's why you see the European Union, this nation-state philosophy doesn't work. And as the nation-state, as the United, as the European Union falls apart, uh, <laughs> a real strong argument will be made for local control, not worldwide control. So just keep an eye on that. And then you got this here too. This guy here, he pretended that he was a girl until he got into the women's shelter and then he started molesting the girls. I mean, what's to stop a teenage boy from doing the same thing after five ed? You know, we need to wake up America and parents, specifically dads, what, who, who's teaching your kids? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I'll say that government schools, all government schools are bad. Why is that? Because they don't have the fear of the Lord. It's a godless education system. It's built on atheism and evolution. They can't even say Merry Christmas at St. Paul. It's really sad. You know the rest of this verse? But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And this is a person. That their assignment was given an example of someone who's impacted your life, and she wrote about Jesus Christ, and she got enough. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Guess what? Are fools teaching our kids? I think that's why we're the mess that we are in today. Get your kids out of that system before it's too late. <clears throat> and then a kid came up to me and a student at St. Cloud State and he says, do you get possessed when you look at pornography? I said, I don't know. But what I do know is Ted Bundy says that's the common denominator of all the serial killers. You can watch this on YouTube. Uh, Ted Bundy, he, uh, you know, he grew up in a Christian home, but he had this dark secret. And he said, of all the serial killers on death row, the common denominators, they were all obsessed with pornography. And it, you get rid of the computer, do whatever you have, can to keep that from in, in destroying lives. And I was talking to Kate, and she says, you know what? I asked her, 
do you think you're a mutated animal or that you were created? He goes, a mutated animal. I said, really? She, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> she goes, people really think they're mutated animals? I said, yeah, that's what's in your textbooks. Natural selections and mutation, that's what got you here. And she goes, no, I think we were created. And I, I, think, I believe in God, but it's not the God of the Bible. And I said, uh, I said, well, could your God communicate to his creation? She goes, sure, yeah. Could your God communicate in a book <laughs> to his creation? And she goes, sure, I see where you're going with this. And I said, is it possible that you believe in the God of the Bible, but you don't care what he says? And she said, I don't know. So just keep planting seeds. And then there was this guy named Nick, and he had the same thing. He asked me why I was doing what I do, and I shared with him. He goes, that's interesting. You know, when I get older, I'll think about it. I said, Nick, you may never get older. And he goes, that's a good point. I said, we all know somebody who's died tragically. Most people who died today didn't plan on it yesterday. And your day could be tomorrow. You know, so for Nick's sake, we're going to build it, make another sign. Forgiveness and redemption, this offer expires when you do. And I'm going to put in parentheses, it may be today. Maybe today. Because we don't know. Accept Christ before it's too late. And then some people say, well, how do you know what you believe is true? And I said, because it's the Word of God. Well, how do you know it's the Word of God? I say, because it's prophetic. Well, they could have just wrote that in after it happened, or when it was translated. I said, no, they couldn't have. And I bring him to uh, Revelation 13, 16. And he caused that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Where is it? It's in their hand or in their forehead. And they have the technology today to do that, the microchip. And this is the news. It's breaking news. Microchip implant available. ABC News. They talked to the guy who developed this. He had the, the technology. And, he, and I think it was Pat Robertson said, uh, he said, well, you know, this could be the mark of the beast. And the guy who had the, had the technology said, no, 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 open up your Bibles. Because in your Bible it says, on your forehead or on your, on your hand, not in. See, the King James says in. The modern versions say on. It's real important you get the right version of the right Bible. And so I was talking to David, and uh, you know, NASB, that all, all these new ones say on. <clears throat> And David, he teaches Bible studies at St. Cloud State. Praise God for him. I said, which Bible do you use? And he says, the NIV. And I said, are you aware that it's missing verses? He says, no. And he says, but isn't it wonderful that we have all these, uh, all these Bible versions? And I said, we have God's preserved word, and we have a lot of corrupted versions. And uh, <clears throat> I was showing this to Christian. Yeah, and we're talking to Christian about this. I said, yeah, let's check out Acts 8.37. Can somebody read Acts 8.37 to me? Do we have any volunteers? On the screen, we've got the NIV version. It goes from 32 down to 39. And guess what? Verse 37 is missing. And Christian, he pulls out his Bible app, and he goes, and he sees it, and goes, dude, no way, no way. That's right, your Bible's missing. It doesn't have all the verses. And there's more versions like that. See, the King James, what should it say? According to the King James, and this is where it's Philip and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch says, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So what's the condition for baptism? The verse that's cut out is, and Philip said, if thou believes with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See, when he could believe it, that's when he should be baptized. Babies don't believe. There's not an example of one baby being baptized in the Bible. It was always an adult that could believe, or not somebody who could believe, and it was always by immersion. And so what does the NIV do with this? In this if you go into blueletterbible.org, it's a great tool to compare scriptures. You can type it in, it's a click away. This is what the NIV has about it. See footnotes. What does that mean? And the ESV says, see footnotes. The NASB has that verse in brackets and said, you know, and what does the brackets mean? Early manuscripts don't contain this verse. So I think understand right now, there's only two Bibles in the world, or two text streams. You have the Textus, Textus, Textus Receptus, which is 90, roughly 99% of the documents, and they all agree. That's the received text, that's the majority text, and that's what the King James and the New King James are based upon. And all the other versions are from a handful of documents, mainly the, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. And, uh, and those two documents disagree with each other. And from those two documents, that's where you get the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, all the modern trans versions. They're translations, maybe good translations, but the wrong text. 
And so, and I can, I, <laughs> I don't know how much time I got, uh, probably not a whole lot, but I could go on and on. If you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, Gail Ripplinger has a book called New Age Bible Versions, and there's some controversy about her, but I'm just saying, look at the stuff, look at the book. She did the research. Eat the meat, spit out the bones, or touch not the unclean thing by David Sorsen. I believe that the King James right now is the preserved word of God. It is, and I can show you where, if you have another version, you could get words for salvation real easy, real easy. But I, I was saved on an NIV. I read it cover to cover, cover for a couple of years because we started reading it to our boys. And uh, one time our son came home and said, uh, check out the, the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11 and compare it to Matthew's. But I just compared uh, the KJVs and the NIVs. What did they cut out of the Lord's Prayer in the new pot, uh, in NIV? Or, which art in heaven, thy will be done as, it, as in heaven, so on earth, and lead us not into the temptation. That's cut out from the NIV. So you could actually read the NIV Lord's Prayer to Satan. You really could. Father, hallowed be thy name. That could be Satan's name. Your kingdom come. That could be Satan's. Give us day, each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins that we also forgive others and who, who sin against us and lead us not into temptation. That could be Satan. When you cut out the heaven stuff. The other one is clear. The King James clearly is God. And then the other thing I don't like about the new versions is they get rid of Lucifer. We were talking about that in Sunday school today. You know, and Isaiah 14, 12, How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. They change that. All the new modern versions, they don't have Lucifer. And what do they change it to? They change it to day star or star of the morning or morning star. This is the one I think that's the most damaging. That's the NIV. Because you go into Blue Letter Bible again and you do a word search on morning star and you get how you have fallen from heaven, morning star. And then that's Isaiah 14, 12. And then you go to Revelations 22, 16. And Jesus says that he's the morning star. So if you use scripture to, to interpret scripture with an NIV, you can make a real strong argument that, that Jesus was cast out of heaven and was actually Lucifer. So when, you're, when you have these versions, <laughs> be careful. And so um, King James, and I could go on. Actually, I could, uh, John 3, 36. You know, the NASB, the problem with that is they change. The King James says, if you, believe, if you believe not, you shall not see life. But what do they say? If you obey not, you shall not see life. There's a big difference from believe and obey. Okay? And uh, just <laughs> goes on and on. The straight is the gate, and the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. So the King James has it's straight and narrow. The new King James says it's narrow and difficult. Is it difficult to believe in Jesus Christ? Jesus did all the work, okay? And so, again, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll skip down to what uh, we really want to get to, and that's the billion-dollar question. Um, has anybody showed you from the Bible what it takes to go to heaven? And uh, it's this excellent question, because I went to church again for 32 years. I had no idea. This girl, real-life situation, she's walking by and say, Ma'am, are you sure you're going to heaven? She goes, I hope so. I said, do you want to know so? She said, yeah. Has anybody ever showed you from the Bible what it takes to go to heaven? She goes, no. And I find out she's a catechism teacher for junior, for grade school. And so I brought her and said, do you know what the wages of sin is? And I forget what she said. But when I grew up, I was taught that the wages of sin was confession, it was penance, it was prayers, our fathers, Hail Marys, rosaries. That's what paid for sin. But no, and I bring her to what, uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to die for our sin. And Jesus did that. You can pay for your own sin in hell. That's a separation. That's what death is, a separation. When your spirit leaves your body, you're separated and you're dead. Okay? Another death is when you're separated from God forever. That's what this would be. You can pay for your own sin in hell forever. Or, if there's a gift of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a gift waiting for it. Excuse me. Do you know how to get that gift? And she said, no. And I said, uh, well, let's just see what the Bible says. And I bring her to Romans uh, 1. Romans 1.16 For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. So what saves you? Believing. Believing what? Believing the gospel. Okay, do you know what the gospel is? She says, the word of God. And I said, more specifically. She said, the Ten Commandments. And I said, not quite. And so I bring her to 1 Corinthians 15 where it defines the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, and that he was buried and rose the third day, that's the gospel. 
and it's not by works. <laughs> and I said, does baptism save? And she said, yes. So I brought her to this verse. And I brought her to 1 Corinthians 1.17, where Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What saves us? It's the gospel. Okay? And, he can, and is baptism part of the gospel? No, because he's preaching the gospel. Not ba baptism is not part of the gospel. Baptism does not save. I say, well, what does save? I brought her to Acts 16.31. This is the jailer. Asks Paul and Silas, who brought them on and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in Acts 16.31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You believe. There's a free gift. And she was Catholic, so I said, uh, uh, You believe that Peter was the first pope, right? And she said, Yeah. And I said, Well, let's see what he had to say about this. And I brought her to 1 Peter 1.18 1, and 19. It says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. I said, you ever heard of indulgences? She said, yeah. That's when people were paying to get out of it. They, connect. they were paying silver and gold so that their sins could be taken away, or dead people could have their sins taken away and they could go to purgatory. The Vatican was built on indulgences. That nice fancy cathedral there that was built on a false teaching. And it were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition. We're not saved by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, and blem without blemish and without spot. It's only the shed blood of Jesus Christ that pays for our sins. It's not tradition. It's not money. And it says, for, and I said, and by the which we, I bring up to Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus paid it all once for all. And they had the sacrifice of the mass every week or day. They're sacrificing Jesus over and over again. That does not save. Jesus paid it all. And uh, Hebrews 10, 11 says, And every priest standing daily, ministering and offering times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So basically, what, and, and, and when I'm doing this, I'm opening the book to her and I'm giving it to her, and I've got the verses highlighted. So it's not what I say, it's what God says. And so then she reads it, and then I ask her about it. And if she understands it, I say, great, and then we move on. But if she doesn't understand it, I said, well, maybe you want to read it again. And so we get them through, and this is the Bible. It's not the word of man. And then when I come to this, I go, I have to read John 3, 14 to 18, because it's believe, 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 believe. It's not works. And you guys know this verse, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so she's in a real difficult predicament if she wants to keep teaching that catechism. And then this is the verse we quoted earlier. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. That's 1 John 5, 13. And then there's some people out there that say, well, Jesus only died for the elect. You mentioned Calvinism before. And that's a perversion of the character of God. Because in 1 Timothy 2, 4-6, it is, For it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You notice it's not Mary, it's not the saints, it's not the Pope, it's not the priest. There's one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So you now Calvinist believes that some people are destined to heaven and some are predestined to, they're predestined to heaven that's what they talk about well if that's the case other people are predestined to hell and they might say you know they might disagree with that double predestination thing so you just go into google and you type in john calvin chapter 21 and you're going to get the title of his book his chapter 21 of his third volume it is of the eternal of the eternal election by which god has predestined some to salvation and others to destruction John Calvin believed in double predestination. And my Bible says, Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his life, his only begotten son. Jesus died for the world, and he wants everybody to go to heaven. Pastor Kakuza had a real good message on Calvinism, and you can watch that on YouTube. After listening to this message, you're never going to read John 3.16 the same again. This is what I always finish up with when I show them this. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. Okay? If, even if the apostles preached the gospel, it was wrong. They should, it should be an accursed thought message. And it said an angel from heaven. They're putting a lot of faith in what Mary says. A lot of faith. And my brother, he just gave me this video. And they're putting on this, this priest is talking about marvelous grace or something like that. And he's quoting from somebody's diary. That's not scripture. You know? And if they, you know, the angel from heaven, and that's what the Muslims and the Mormons, they each claim they have revelation from an angel. 
you know, this verse should, should, should shoot it down. It's a cursed message. Jesus paid for all our sins. And so with that, we'll just uh, wrap up real, court, real quickly. Um, time is short. I don't know how much time we have left. And like you were saying in Sunday school, there's an eternity. Let's use our time to impact as many people as you can. And I've showed you one way that you can preach the gospel at a Saint Club, at the college. Um, what I'd love to see is people singing hymns there. You guys got a beautiful choir. And it sound, that sound just resonates on some days. You know, just, just love the people into the kingdom. And so again, you know, watch Pastor Kakuza's message on when God's passion becomes our passion. Two, get your eyes off yourself. And then three, do whatever you have to do to ask. Has anybody ever showed you from the Bible what it takes to go to heaven? All right, let's wrap up in prayer. Because you know who we've been talking to? We've been talking to God's children. Now you may be hearing this and you might say, you know what, I never knew the God of the Bible loved people that much. Well, he does. I never knew the God of the Bible saw himself as father to his children. Well, he does. And you might say this, I wish he was my father. Well, he can be. He can be. Let me explain it to you, dear friend. Look at this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Do you see that? For God so loved the world. That includes you. That he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came, was sacrificed for your sins and mine, and came back from the dead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him puts their faith in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means you go to heaven whenever you die. Let me show you this. This hand representing you and me, let my wallet represent our sin. Here we are. God says we're all sinners, right? The Bible says God loves us. He hates our sin, but he does love us. See, sin separates us from the Lord. You can't get to heaven with even one Sin, not even one. We're all sinners. That's what the Bible says. If we're all sinners and we can't get to heaven with even one sin, you know what that means? We're, we're all disqualified. We're disqualified. You might say, well, I'm going to commit to living a good life. You're already disqualified. You're lost. Well, I'm, I'm going to clean up my life. No, you're missing this. You lost already. You're disqualified. You're out of it. You're out of the running. Well, I'm going to make some promises. You've already sinned, so have I, and come short of the glory of God. And God says our sin has to be paid for. So and we do it, we'll spend forever in hell suffering for that. But God doesn't want that for anybody. God loves us, hates our sin, but loves us. See, there's nothing we can do as far as good works to get rid of the sin or living the life or being faithful because we're already disqualified. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin, all of it, upon himself. And he made the complete payment, leaving us nothing to pay for. Came back from the dead to prove it was done. He says this, if you will believe, if you'll put your faith in him, that he made that payment for you, he will give you as a free gift everlasting life. Will you receive it? He's offering it to you today as a free gift everlasting life. He loves you that much. It's too good to be true. No, God loves you that much. That's why it's so good. Christ paid for it. Jesus paid the price. He's offering it to you as a gift. Would you trust in Christ today as your Savior? Let's all bow.